So a very important part of Catholic teaching on end-of-life care is that um, while all of us have an obligation to use ordinary or proportionate means to preserve our lives, um, we can decline any um, treatments or care that we think is extraordinary or disproportionate uh, means of, of saving our lives. So what is a disproportionate um, intervention or treatment? That would be a treatment that in the patient's judgment does not offer a reasonable hope of benefit and may entail an excessive burden or impose unnecessary expense on the family or the community. And what I like about that definition is it really does allow the person to think about their own preferences and their own family needs. So um, I was giving the example of being on a ventilator. It's an uncomfortable proposition, but if you're you know, 25 years old and you have a appendicitis and you just underwent surgery, you probably can tolerate it and do fine when you, you know, have your um, ventilator removed. But if you are in advanced stages of cancer and you're 90 years old, um, it's very uncomfortable to be on a ventilator. And if it's only going to help you live another two or three days, that may be something that the family or the patient, him or herself, may say, I don't think that's what I want. And that's fine. And this is from the um, Ethical and Religious Directives <laughs> for Healthcare Services from the US Conference of Catholic Bishops. So uh, we're all obliged to take those ordinary measures, but we're not obliged to take um, procedures that either cause harm or undesirable side effects. Um, one of the primary purposes of medicine and caring for the dying is to relieve suffering. Um, so while medically assisted nutrition and hydration is not mer morally obligatory, in certain cases um, they should be provided. So we should provide um, nutrition, assisted nutrition, in cases of a person who's in a uh, persistent vegetative state, that person is living. Um, but again, if it's someone who is at the very end of life, my own experience is with oncology patients, and when you get to the very end of life, people are no longer walking around, they're not moving a lot, and so they're not using a lot of nutrition. And so to continue to provide tube feedings for someone who's very close to death, um, oftentimes the body won't tolerate them, so it can cause vomiting or excessive diarrhea. Um, so sometimes, towards the end of life, um, we may decide that nutrition is um, a little um, extraordinary or cause more suffering than benefit. Um, so when the body can no longer absorb the food and fluids, it's acceptable to withdraw them, and that is from the Ethical and Religious Directives for Catholic Healthcare. Um, the principle of double effect is what philosophers um, call saying that um, there are things we do in healthcare that have both a positive and a negative effect. So it, almost, almost anything we do in healthcare, so starting an IV to give you some um, hydration, it hurts a little bit to have a needle put into your vein. But if you have been sick with the flu and you're very dehydrated, it's wonderful to get fluid back in your body after you've been very sick. So it's, it, we have a, both a good and a bad action, or negative effect. But um, here's the rule of double effect. The action itself, so starting the IV, is good or at least neutral. The good effect, not the bad effect, is intended. So I don't intend to hurt my patient if I start an IV. I intend to hydrate them and make them feel better. So the good effect, not the bad effect, is intended. And the good effect is not produced by the bad effect. There's a proportionately grave reason for permitting the bad effect. That's really important with euthanasia, and we teach our students at Catholic University this all the time. Um, make sure you understand when caring for patients at the end of life, why are you giving that medication? You should be giving the medication because the patient is uncomfortable, and you've assessed your patient thoroughly, and either you can see the patient's uncomfortable, and there's lots of things we assess. Is the muscle tension, are they gripping the sides of the bed rail, or are they, you know, are their arms pulled to get towards their body? Are they uncomfortable? Not everyone has to tell us my pain is a 10 on a zero to 10 pain, pain scale, because not everyone can tell you that if they're very, very sick. So we have to assess their body language. What are they saying with um, in regard to discomfort? So I know when I go in the room, I'm assessing the patient, and if I see signs of discomfort, that's why I'm giving medication. And the medication should be proportionate to the patient's discomfort. 
if ever I have a doubt, so if I see an order on it, um, on a medication, on a chart that says give 20 milligrams of morphine, and I think, oh, wait a minute, that patient's used to getting two milligrams of morphine. Why would I give 20 milligrams? Or why would I give 10 for patients that's used to only getting 1.5? I would ask a question. I'd say, I'm sorry, I can't give that. It doesn't seem like I need that to control their pain. So we need nurses who ask questions, but, but also don't hesitate to give adequate pain medication to keep their patient comfortable. Dying patients, we do have dying patients who request that we hasten their, their um, dying process. We shouldn't tell those patients they're bad or I'm not gonna care for you anymore. Realize that you know the question should be, tell me a little bit more about what you're feeling right now or what are your concerns? Are they afraid that their pain is so intense and they can't get relief? Are they afraid that they're too great of a burden on their family? Why would someone be requesting this? It's important to know that 11 states in the United States right now have legalized euthanasia. I've spoken myself, even though I'm not a very political person, but when I saw a, um, it's called assisted dying legislation coming before the Maryland um, legislation, I felt strongly enough that I went and actually testified and said, there is no um, palliative care organization of which I know that would ever support this legislation we as nurses are healers. Um, we are here to comfort patients. We are not to end their lives. There is nothing that could justify intentionally ending a patient's life. So it's very worrisome, to say the least, that 11 states have approved these legislation. We've defeated it in Maryland four times, and it's going again before the legislature. So you know, all I can say is contact your local senator or representative and tell them how against we are euthanasia. Is it ever right? No. In no circumstances is euthanasia ever right. No purpose, no law whatsoever can ever make it right. So intentionally ending the life of a patient is never morally justifiable. Um, I wanted to say a bit about caregiving, family caregiving, because so many of us, oh, yes ma'am. Um, I just wanted to add one thing to what you were saying about assist, about the um, Physician Assisted Suicide Bill. Yes. It's coming up this month. Mm -hmm. And you can write to um, online www.mdmaryland.rtl.mdmdrtl.mdrtl.mdrtl.mdrtl.mdrtl.mdrtl.mdrtl.mdrtl.mdrtl.mdrtl.mdrtl.mdrtl.mdrtl.mdrtl.m
um, addressing depression if it exists. We have both non-pharmacologic ways to address mental health concerns and pharmacologic. So a good primary care provider can help assess those. Um, helping people achieve happiness. So Father gave so many great examples of how we can think about our end of life as a way of um, returning to God. And I love the analogy of a birth. It's, it's a little hard at the end, but then we have glory in the, in the ultimate um, uh, reuniting reunite, with God. It's beautiful. Um, social, we really, when we think about caring for patients um, at the end of life or who are very fragile, we really think about the whole family, um, the financial challenges of caring for someone at the end of life, um, realizing that caregivers need respite. So if you have family members, sometimes when I'm dealing with families who are going through end-of-life care, I'm coaching them on asking other family members to help. I said, you probably have people coming up to you all the time saying, um, can I help you? Is there something I can do? And they're really earnest in that. There was a gentleman in my parish, and he's, his wife had very advanced Alzheimer, and one day um, he was trying to get her out of the car to go into mass, and it was, it was such a struggle, and it was pouring rain, so I walked over with an umbrella and said, can I help you? And he said, yes, and then I realized how advanced his wife's Alzheimer's was, and I said, you know, I come to the eight o'clock mass with my husband, but if you would ever like to go to another mass, I would be happy to watch your wife for you while you come to mass. He said, that would be wonderful. And so then, we really just had to get two or three or four ladies at the parish to volunteer to do that so that he had an option to go out and do something about every week or every other week. It didn't take much, you know, I only had to invest, I think, maybe an hour and a half once every three weeks. And it was I was happy to do it, and so were the other ladies in the parish. So sometimes it's marshalling the supports of the community to help people get through these challenging periods. And of course, um, spiritual hope, suffering, meaning of pain. To be present to people at the end of life is extremely important. Sometimes people um, volunteer for hospice, and they want to know what should I say what should I do for someone that's at the end of life, often you don't have to say much. You, you might just ask questions, like how are you doing today? Um, you know, a little, asking them about their family or, or a little life review. These things are you know, wonderful to do with people. Um, family decision making. Family decision making can be challenging because there's so many things that we have to keep in mind. So we're thinking of the patient's needs, and I just mentioned physical, psychological, spiritual, we're also thinking of what are the decision points. Um, you know, oftentimes, because I, I have studied end-of-life care for several years, you know, friends and colleagues would often um, ask me, they'd say, you know, my mother's in the ICU, here are the things they're offering, I, I'm thinking about this, but I wonder if this is not a good idea. So they just want someone to process with, just, you know, decide. These are very complicated decisions, and so, I think the biggest mistake sometimes people make is thinking that there's one right answer. I've just got to find the one right answer. When actually, all these things have to be taken into consideration. You know, again, what's the benefit of the treatments being offered? And when you combine these two or three treatments, what's the benefit of the kind of the package of treatments being offered? And so there's no harm in asking um, to consult with someone to say, can I talk with my parish priest? Can I talk with my um, my mother's primary physician before talking to the ICU doctor and saying what I think we want? Can I talk to um, Dr. Bigany, who's in my parish, and she knows a lot about patient care? So reach out and get some consultation, because it can, these decisions can be really hard. And don't always think that there's one right decision. Um, you know, sometimes I, I have found that people, 10 years after the death, say, I'm just not sure I should have said you know, I, I had a good friend who's a nurse, and she said, I have this reoccurring dream that maybe I should have told the doctor, no, don't take up mom off the ventilator. Maybe one more time we could get her out of the hospital. And her mother had been hospitalized five times in one year for advanced heart failure. And each time it was harder and harder for her to come back. So she was having dreams a year later. Maybe I should have said, no, let's try and keep her on the ventilator a little longer. And I said, you know what? Your mom is with God and your mom was headed towards God, whether you made that decision of taking her off the ventilator this time or three weeks later, you know, your mom is still with God. So um, 
I mean, I don't want to be presumptuous. I know we always pray for the dead. So, but in general, you know, there's not always one right answer. When we think of the family healthcare needs, um, you know, some families are together on making these decisions about end of life care, and some families can be very disparate. They they can have a great deal of disagreement. And I've heard um, nurses talk about the out of town daughter, and that's because in general, uh, women are caregivers 60% of the time, and so uh, we're often we're more often caregivers at the end of life than males are. So um, what happens is you often have the the family member who's caring for this very fragile patient, a patient at the end of life, on a daily basis, and they see this patient declining. And so they see, oh, I think I think mom's winding down, I think we're headed towards the end, but the daughter who lives in New York, who hasn't seen mom for the past, you know, at least not on a regular basis, hasn't seen mom for a, you know every day, doesn't realize mom's declining, so she flies into Maryland, or you know, from California flies in, and says, wait a minute, what about physical therapy? Have we tried that? And the other daughter's going, oh my gosh, physical therapy was like a year ago. We went through physical therapy and she is nowhere near being capable of participating in physical therapy at this time. <coughs> but yet the out-of-town daughter's like, no, 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 let's try one more thing. So what often I think has to happen for the out-of-town daughter is the out-of-town daughter needs to feel like a good daughter that she's been doing a good job caring for mom. So one thing we can do is help her with that. You know, and, and as nurses, we sometimes talk to patients. And um, a good friend of mine, uh, Pam Hines, does this with parents of children who are dying. They say, what does it mean to you to be a really good dad right now? Or what does it mean to you to be a really good mom right now? Or what does it mean to you to be a really good daughter? And then listen to what they say. <laughs> Maybe they'll say, well, I think, you know, if I could just make sure my mom is comfortable, if I could just make sure my mom knows how much I love her, if I could just make sure that my mom knows I wish I wasn't such a really awful teenager, um, then I would feel better about this. So we have to hear what does it mean to be a good daughter or son, and then once we hear that, try and make that happen. So if, as a nurse, if someone says, I wish my mom knew how much I was sorry about being a terrible teenager. But you know what? I kind of think your mom knows that, but hearing is the last thing to go in life, so we, we'll put a chair right here for you, and even though your mom is not opening her eyes, you talk to her and you tell her you're sorry for being an awful teenager, and I think she's gonna hear that. So really finding out um, what that family member needs to kind of come to peace and conclusion. <laughs> And of course, the ideal is that we do these things before someone is you know, um, non-responsive in the very end of life. So the more we can encourage families to um, be in harmony and find forgiveness, the better that can be. And I do a lot of things with my, I studied end of life care for a lot of years to see how we could help make it better. And um, in one study, we asked patients, is there anything that you've done over the last two weeks that's made this situation of being you know, very sick better. We asked what, may, what makes things worse and what makes things better. And one gentleman said, oh my goodness, he said, I contacted my ex-wife and I called her and I said, I've been an awful person. I was a terrible husband, I was a terrible father, and I'm only calling you because I hope that you'll forgive me. And he said to me, and you know what? She did. And so he said, and then I was so encouraged that I called my daughter. And I said, I've been a terrible father. I was never good at you know, being the father I should have been. And I'm just calling you now because I want to ask for your forgiveness. And he said, and you know what? She did. And so I thought, oh my gosh, I felt like I was standing on hallowed ground. That people find forgiveness. They ask forgiveness, they give forgiveness. The end of life is a very rich period. So the more we can facilitate those conversations or enable people to be present, to their loved one at the end of life, I do find that that brings greater peace. Um, sometimes people who are caring for a loved one at the end of life, they wanna know, can you tell me when it's coming? Well, first of all, there's lots of studies of doctors, and doctors are only 50% right, so you might as well toss a coin. If you ask the doctor, um, what they usually say is, how surprised are you that your patient would have died in the next two weeks? 
and then if the doctor is very surprised and then the patient dies, they say, well, that wasn't on target. So it actually comes out to be about 50 or 50% 50 right. So that's not very, very right. Um, so um, here are some things that nurses have observed that you can tell when a patient is winding down and death is getting a little bit closer. So when the patient starts to have difficulty swallowing, so they don't want to eat anymore, um, the pain, when they start to, some, some people call this winding down, um, when they, the pain seems to lessen, when they seem less anxious, when you start to notice their extremities might feel a little bit cool to the touch, um, the body temperature is unstable, this has to do with the brain stem, so maybe they're hot one minute and then literally 10 minutes later they're cold, so it just means that the, the brain is beginning to shut down. Um, when they have some um, involuntary movements, so you see their arm moves quickly, again, the brain is beginning to close down, or it could be the muscles are beginning to, um, to <coughs> atrophy, or that maybe there's a little bit of imbalance in the, in the potassium of the blood. There are a lot of reasons that at the end of life, people have these um, movement. Eyes become glazed, or people call them glassy. It becomes difficulty speaking, or people stop speaking. Um, and then some people describe at the very end of life unexpected energy. So a friend of mine had a very funny story that um, he was a priest and he went to give last rites to a patient and the patient was just really non-responsive. And so he thought, well, death is very close to this patient. So he, he gave last rites to the patient and um, then he left to go on to see other patients. And the family called him back and he thought, why would they call me back? This patient was dying. And so in fact, the patient had died and they said, Father, and he walked in the room, and they said, Father, 10 minutes after you left, our father was totally unconscious, and suddenly he, he like stirred, opened his eyes, and said, give the priest $20. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he died, and then he died. So all of the sons reached into their wallet, and they each handed $20 to the priest. <laughs> so you do sometimes see that right Right before they die, sometimes people rally. Some, I'm not quite sure of what the mechanism is behind that, but sometimes people become alert and then they die. Um, breathing becomes erratic. Um, the brainstem, again, controls the regularity of your breathing. So as people are getting close to death and there's less blood going to the brain, you sometimes see these very irregular breathing patterns. Um, in fact, there's something called chain-stoking breathing that is a deep breath and then you might not hear a breath for a while, and then you might hear a couple of what they call with agonal breath, where <gasps> and then nothing. And again, this is your brainstem most likely shutting down, and the regularity of the breathing is, is stopping. Um, there's also something called, uh, it sounds like wet breathing, um, it, like there, as if there is uh, fluid in the um, airway, but actually it's more like fluid backing up in the lungs, because again, everything is stopping. The heart is slowing down, blood is no longer circulating as quickly towards the end of life, so that's where you hear a little bit of wet breathing. Okay. Um, eyes lose focus, but eyes might also open and not close, um, so that's also um, common near death or at death. Eyes could remain open. So sometimes people will just close them, like literally put their fingers over them and close the eyes. Yes, ma'am? Um, all these symptoms together? Well, no, I mean, like the breathing. Oh, the breathing? Yeah. Um, you know, these, this is breathing at the very, very end. Right. So I don't believe so because I'm used to looking at patients completely. Like, I'm also looking, again, as I said, like, are their hands clenched? Are their arms um, showing signs of rigidity? And when I've seen people with this kind of breathing, they're totally relaxed. Okay. So I don't sense that there's pain or discomfort going on. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, I know you're going to have another talk about palliative and hospice care, but generally um, this is considered holistic care. Every palliative care organization that I know of does not support euthanasia, is actively against it. So, um, you know, assess your, your palliative care um, organization. <laughs> palliative care is, is care that's given really, um, sometimes, well, hospital will call it the advanced symptom management team. This is not the very, very end of life. This might people that people that have cancer that are undergoing 
very difficult chemotherapy or radiation treatments, so they want to control their, their symptoms a little better, so they may call the palliative care team that can help with that. Um, hospice care really is, that's that subset of palliative care that is the very end of life. And in the US, hospice care usually lasts about two weeks, and that's usually because people don't become aware of hospice care until someone suggests it to them. Um, and so it's usually the very, very end of life. Um, it is covered by Medicare, which is helpful. Um, but again, it, they're often called in at the very, very end. It's really okay to call the palliative care in, team in if, you've under, if you have a cancer patient or advanced heart failure patient, because they are pretty good at managing symptoms. And palliative care are the people that really handle the very, very end of life. And I think they usually do a very good job. Um, so what do you do to qualify for hospice care? Um, you have to have a physician that says you have a prognosis of six months or less um, of life. Um, you have to have made a decision that you, know, you want comfort care, that you don't want to go back to the hospital in the ICU. I mean, not everyone wants that. Every, sometimes patients want to go to the hospital for their end of life care, and that's okay. Um, and then other patients want to stay home. Usually, study after study, um, about 80% of Americans want to, if they could, would like to stay home um, and die at, at home at the end of life. But um, you know, I also had a, a study of a woman with ALS. She was at home being cared for by her husband, and she said to him, I think it's time to go to the hospital now. And he said, no, no, no. He said, I know how to care for you. We're doing fine. You can stay home. And she said, no, I don't want you to remember me dying in this house for the rest of your life. So she said, we're going to the hospital. So they went to the hospital, and she passed away about two days later. So people have different preferences about location of death and who cares for them at the end of life. So it's great for families to discuss this. So I just want to point out also, um, Alzheimer's is also considered the end of life. And so many, many families can get hospice care either in the nursing home or in their own home, and it's reevaluated every six months. And it's a great program, especially because you don't know when Alzheimer's is going to be the final. But it is a, it's an end of life. I mean, there's no cure for it. So that's also something to consider when somebody has Alzheimer's and wants to go home and they need some additional care. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's good to know about. Advanced directives, it's a good thing to know what these are. So there's generally two types. One is called a living will, and that's where you can write, um, write down your preferences for treatment or care at the end of life. Another is called healthcare power of attorney, and that's where you designate frequently a family member, could be a close friend, to speak for you if you become unable to speak for yourself about what treatments or care that you would like. Generally, I think, the healthcare power of attorney is a better way to go because, as I said, these decisions can be very complex and it's helpful to know um, what the person's preferences are. So if, ideally, if you've got a close family member and you've had these discussions, it makes it a little bit easier for your family member to know what to do. Living wills, um, they are also helpful. It gives you an idea of what the person that's thinking of, but um, people might write down, you know, no, tube feeding, no resuscitation. But actually, sometimes tube feedings can be really, really helpful and sustain someone, and sometimes resuscitation is appropriate for someone that's not at the end of life. So these are complicated decisions, so just to write them on a piece of paper as if they will always apply, it's really um, context matters. You know, how sick you are, how close you are to the end of life, how advanced your disease is, all these things go into deciding what's the appropriate treatment. So in general, I think healthcare power of attorney is a little bit better. Um, there have been studies that have shown that grief is less intense in family members who at least had had a discussion with the patient who died and knew what they wanted. So they, they saw themselves as carrying out the patient's wishes and not as I was deciding what, what I thought was best based on my beliefs. So to the extent that you can say, yes, I talked to this person and I knew 
what she or he wanted, that's a little helpful for the family to know. So that's a clue for all of us. If we have family members, talk to them and say, you know what, I, of course, cherish my life. I love every minute of my life. But if the time comes where I'm in a hospital bed or an ICU and nothing they've done seems to help and you know the doctor has no hope for the prognosis, lots of things would make you know me say, it's okay not to resuscitate me again and again, or it's okay you know, not to give certain treatments. So I, I think giving your family members an idea of what you want or what you don't want, do you want to be cared for at home, do you want to be cared for you know, in other facilities or in the hospital at the end of life, giving people um, your thoughts on that can be very helpful. Um, what's an ethics panel or consultation team? So I was actually on the ethics consultation team at Johns Hopkins for 13 years. Um, the, they can be helpful. You need to know your own, you know, Catholic values and teaching on end of life care because it's possible that not every member of the ethics team will be Catholic or knowledgeable of our Catholic teachings but they can be helpful to come in and talk things over. They're usually either called in by the family or by the medical team when there's um, difficulty with a particular decision. And I've seen this go um, a couple of different ways. It could be the family that's, that's saying to the medical team, no, you know, my mother didn't want to be in the ICU and she didn't want to be on a ventilator and now you're resuscitating her over and over again and that's not what we want. So sometimes the family calls the consultation because they're saying the medical team is not listening to us. We you know, we know what our mother wanted and this is not it. But it's also the opposite way. The medical team is saying to the family, just a few more things. We could just do a few more things and we think we could make your mom well enough that she could be discharged to home or to a nursing home. Just there are a few more things we want to do. And the family is saying, nope, nope, we don't want to do that. But the medical team's thinking, I think you should be saying yes. And so they'll call the ethics consultation team, who sometimes serves as a mediator between the medical team and the family to try and work out what would be best for this patient and this family. So they can be very helpful. Um, and then this is the last slide. Just to say, and Father really introduced um, bereavement and grief very much. You know, our loved one has gone to God. You know, um, so they're, they are at peace. But we are at home thinking, how am I going to live now without my husband or my father or my mother? Or how am I going to go on? And, then, and grief can be very, very difficult to deal with. So having close friends and family members check in with one another. You know, when my parents passed, on the when the first one passed, you know, my father died, we were just almost in shock. And I, who am a nurse that have been studying end of life for 20 years, I was in shock. You know, there is this kind of existential crisis that happens when someone who you love very deeply is gone. And so, and you know, I have a very big Catholic family with eight brothers and sisters, but we all kind of sat around going, wow, dad is gone. You know, it just, we, we were all talking about, you know, gee, doesn't even feel right to be in the house without him. You know, it was so, you know, just so different. And then when my mother passed away, we were a little more ready for that crisis. We were a little bit more prepared for it. We'd gone through it. We knew, you know, how it felt and how we would go on. So, and actually there are studies that show that if you've been through the death of one close family member, the second one is a little bit easier because after the second one, you know that you will go on and that you know, you'll form, your, your family relationships will kind of reform uh, without that person and you'll still go forward. So, um, so the, the extent that we can help one another during the grieving period and being aware that you know, a close friend, you know, maybe they had a close family member die, they're not gonna be better next week or next month. It may be a year, it may be 10 years for some people, but to the extent that we can check in with them and say, how are you doing? You want to go to lunch? You want to come over for dinner? You know, my sister for about for five years had a, a parish member who lost his wife come over for dinner every Sunday because he was still working through that for five years. And then and he seemed to just get, his spirit seemed to get lifted and he was okay after that. But we may have to kind of be present um, with people we know to help them through this. So that is what I have. So I think um, Father Larry or I, We'd be happy to answer questions.